even in the creation narrative, which we believe as Christians that the world was created ex nihilo, that means out of nothing. Stop! Did he just say that young earth creationists believe that the universe and earth were created out of nothing? Dr. Frank Turek. Turek? Dr. Frank. He's a well-known Christian apologist, author, and speaker, famous for his debates on the existence of God and the reliability of the Christian faith. <laughs> When it comes to the age of the earth, well, his view stirred up quite the conversation. Old Frankie boy is often associated with young earth creationism, which suggests, as we all know, that the earth is only a few thousand years old based on a literal interpretation of the Bible, specifically Genesis 1. And this viewpoint clashes with the scientific consensus, which estimates the earth to be about 4.5 billion years old. But that view is based on a wealth of evidence from various fields like geology, physics and astronomy. And it's always puzzled me. They say that thousands of science books are wrong, but their book, singular, one book, holds the secrets to everything. So let's take a peek and see what he has to say for himself, shall we? Hmm? Please subscribe. Is the Earth around 8,000 years old. No. Is micro and macro evolution biblically compatible? And uh, no again. I'm absolutely certain that the universe is at least 59 years old. Moi ha ha. Uh, as you know, Christians disagree over this and uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about different views of this. But I can guarantee you one thing, that when you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, Did you think it was old or young? This guy's cracking me up. <laughs> if any of what you said was true, then surely all Christians would agree with it? Because, you know, you all worship the same God and read the same Bible and whatnot. Now, I personally think that Genesis 1 was written by Moses as a polemic against the Egyptian creation stories. You mean this? In the beginning, there were only the chaotic and dark waters of none, and from these primordial waters emerged a mound of dry land, and upon this mound the first god, Ra, appeared. Ra was self-created, and with his arrival, he brought forth light and order. Is that the one you mean? And I don't know about you, but I've always found the best way to correct a ridiculous story is to replace it with an even more ridiculous story. <laughs> because when people are coming out of ex they're coming out of Egypt, they're coming across the desert. They're not walking around going, "I wonder how old this place is." Right? <laughs> That's not what they're wondering. They're not wondering about evolution or what they're wondering is why there's so much sand everywhere. Is Yahweh the true God, or are the gods that we just came from in Egypt the true God? That was going to be my next guess, obviously. The gods in, in, in Egypt that supposedly created the universe somehow created themselves or were already in the universe and then ordered it. And Moses comes along and says, no, God is outside this space-time continuum. Ah, right, and there's me thinking your surname was Tarek, not Brown. The space-time continuum. Well, that's handy, isn't it? Saying that God exists outside the space-time continuum steps into territory that's beyond what science can explore or verify since our understanding of existence is tied to space and time, and anything outside of that is beyond our current scientific methods to observe or test for. And while it's an intriguing idea, it's important to remember that science deals with what can be observed and measured within the universe. So from a scientific standpoint, claims about anything existing outside of space and time are speculative and not evidence-based. But I don't think it's necessary. And as you know, God has written two books. He's written the book called the Bible and the book of nature. And by the way, you can't understand the book called the Bible without the book of nature. I mean, just read the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Two books? I always thought God was like a one-hit wonder. But it turns out the book of nature is available on Amazon. But the author's Barbara Manahe or Mahan... Barbara. No mention of God, I'm afraid. No, I've got it. Barbara Mahane is God's pseudonym. Or nom de plume in French. Vive la France, as they say in Rome. I mean, he's not going to use his own name, is he? Obviously. I mean, who wants that kind of attention? Okay, what does that imply you already know? First of all, it implies you know language, right? It also implies you know what a beginning is. It implies you have some idea of what God is. It implies you have some idea of what cause and effect is, right? Some idea of what creation is. Ah, yes, implication, because sometimes saying something directly is just too easy. These are the things you bring to the text and you have to know before you can know anything the Bible says. 
hang on a second, I'm having a little bit of trouble making sense of that. So is he saying that in order to be able to read the Bible, you first need to be able to read? Well, duh. Or is he saying that you must already have some preconceived ideas and a belief that God is real before you read the Bible to convince yourself that God is real? And in, in, as Chip, he's a seminary professor, he knows there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect of theology called prolegomena, which means what you do before you do theology. And it includes these kind of things, philosophy, language, grammar, the cause and effect, the reliability of your senses to know how you can ascertain truths about the real world. And that's all fine and dandy, but have any of you ever stopped and thought, hmm, maybe the Bible isn't the best book to read to learn about ah. You want to say anything about the Egyptians or add <clears throat> well, to that at all? Well, you know, the Egyptian sun god was their uh -huh. raw, was like the most important. Yeah. And the sun's created on day four. It's almost like, oh, the sun? Yeah, forget about it. You know, uh -huh. um, it, the, yeah, there's, there's polemic there. But how? Why exactly is it that you think that the Egyptian creation story is attacking the Christian creation story? Is it because it's different to you, a version of events? So, sorry, what was that? Where did I get my swanky new t-shirt from? Well, they're available at creakyblinder.com. Link below. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the question is, is, you know, if you read the text, does it seem to indicate that there was a day? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the literal reading of the text. Yeah, and taking the Bible literally is where you all go wrong. And you know, the more videos I make about young earth creationists, the more I'm starting to question who exactly it is they're trying to convince. Is it people like me or themselves? What are we actually reading? In Genesis 1 are we reading a scientific treatise mm. like we think of in the world today or are we reading a theological document that's helping the you know newly found people that have come out of Egyptian bondage to understand who Yahweh is and in their world they did not have the same cosmology that we do they didn't have the same questions that we do um, they believed that matter was eternal Right. So like even in the creation narrative, which we believe as Christians that the world was created ex nihilo, that means out of nothing. Stop! Did he just say that young earth creationists believe that the universe and earth were created out of nothing? He did, didn't he? Maybe we should let Kent Hovind know that his main argument is no longer valid. <laughs> No, scrap that, it never was. Anyway, should Genesis 1 be taken literally? It really depends on your perspective and how you reconcile your religious beliefs with scientific understanding. Now, I get comments from people all the time saying things like, I'm a Christian and I don't take Genesis literally, which tells me that it is possible for them to believe in God and accept science. So why don't they? In Genesis 1, the, the reality is in the text, <laughs> God comes upon the world. It's already there. So what exactly is it that you lot are claiming that he created then? And it doesn't have any form. It's, mm -hmm. it's void. It, it needs to be put together. Well, that makes even less sense than the nonsense we usually hear from young earth creationists. At least they are claiming that God made everything. You're basically saying that the earth was a jigsaw puzzle or a Rubik's cube and God solved it. And the word create, bara in Hebrew, um, can mean to create something that was not here to something that was here, but it can also mean create in me a new heart, O Lord. In other words, arrange it in a way that's right. So you, you have to ask, is Genesis 1 ontological creation or is it functional creation? And to me, that's a perfect explanation about why Genesis 1 should definitely not be taken literally. Because if you've got to perform any amount of mental gymnastics to make a story fit with what you already believe, then, well, that makes it just a story. Um, and, and so, you know, a reading of the text, you're going to have people bogged down. Some are going to say it's functional creation. God is ordering the world and he's putting things together so that the world functions properly because it's chaotic and mm -hmm. he comes upon it. Others would say, no, this is a scientific thing, you know, um, a la Ken Ham and those types of people. Um, I think the, the real thing is, is that we shouldn't make the reading of Genesis 
a test for orthodoxy. Ah, oh, no wonder Christianity's on the decline. If there's a test to get in, some people just don't do well at tests. Now, from the mid 20th century, there has been a gradual decline in adherence to established Christianity in a process described as secularization, which is characterized by observance of various spiritual concepts without adhering to any organized religion. Brilliant. Something else for young earth creationists to whinge about. Probably my fault though for bringing it up. But I, my personal feeling is, is that creation is giving us the sense of how God works not only in the world, but he works in our hearts. Paul in the Corinthian correspondence talks about creation, that the light shone in our hearts, it's the gospel. And the creation story is a wonderful gospel because it, it's taking something that's chaotic and ordering it to where it's good. And I think that that's what God wants to do in all of creation. He wants to take things that are messed up and not right, and he wants to form them in such a way that they are good. And I so when God created everything, including the microscopic parasite called a canthamoeba, whose entire life cycle relies on burrowing into the eyes of people and blinding them, it was so people would think he was a good guy, okay? Um. I mentioned the two books that God has written, and the, the book of nature and the, and the book called the Bible through other people, obviously. Well, yeah, obviously, we've already established this pseudonym is Barbara. Hang on a second, I've just realized something. No, this is going to absolutely blow your mind. God's pseudonym is Barbara. Barbara Cartland also writes books. Therefore, God is Barbara Cartland. How was that for a little bit of creationist logic? Um, sometimes you side with the book of nature to tell you what the book of Bible, what, 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 the, what the book called the Bible means. In fact, for example, sunrise and sunset, right? The Bible says the sun rises and the sun sets. So how are we to take that? Are we to take it that it's a literal sun that's literally rising and literally setting? Well, yes. The sun rises and sets because of the Earth's rotation on its axis. I didn't think I'd have to be explaining this in a creationist video. Flat earthers, fair enough, but surely not young earth creationists as well. Because we know through, through nature that we're actually going around the sun. The sun isn't going around us. You might want to share that information with any flat earthers you happen across on your travels, Frank. By the way, we do this today in our scientific age. If you watch the news tonight, the local news, you're going to see the, the, the meteorologist going to say, you know, sunrise tomorrow at 614. He's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent at 614. Okay? So observational language, that's how we understand the Bible. And you can use things from outside the Bible. In fact, you have to use things from outside the Bible to understand what the Bible says. Or, like every young earth creationist ever, you have to use things from outside the Bible to ensure that you completely misunderstand what it is the Bible is attempting to explain. Oh, you're still here then. I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe even learned something new. If you did, then you'll probably enjoy this video as well. Don't forget to hit the like button if you haven't already and subscribe if you're new. And I will see you all again very soon or in a few minutes if you do decide to watch this recommended video. <laughs> Love you, bye.